Okay, this is uh, the next in the series about uh, my experiences with LRH. And last talk, we covered uh, up through most of 1962 when I was doing the briefing course in, at St. Hill in East Grinstead. And I think we covered um, various points there about uh, LRH doing TV demos and uh, students on the briefing course doing TV demos and having LRH critiques on them and uh, the various other things that were going on. I'm not sure if I covered duplication drills. Uh, the beginning of the duplication drill started in um, about mid-62, and the idea behind them was that <clears throat> up until that time, most of the technical writings that LRH had done in HCOBs and uh, PABs and so on had included a large amount of theory as well as just what the process commands were. And the idea behind that was so that auditors would understand the theory of the process and they'd be able to use their judgment and their understanding in applying the process. Around that point, he had decided that that was not a wise thing or not a workable way to go about it. And he started changing his style of writing and his style of teaching to that of just getting auditors to duplicate the commands and the rules and, to, as he put it once, to hell with their understanding. And it's quite noticeable to see this change if you compare the early tech materials and tapes where there's a lot of theory um, as well as the rules. And then at a certain point, and it's around about this time in 62, it starts changing over to more just the commands and the rules, and this is how you do it, and so on and so forth, with some theory, but uh, not as much as before. And duplication drills were being developed then to bring about um, people duplicating things uh, rotely or word for word, whereby they would learn... Uh, the commands of a process verbatim. Uh, they would learn the model session pattern verbatim, and they'd have a list of indicators that you learned verbatim. And uh, <clears throat> I guess they should have been called the verbatim period. The theory checkouts on course also changed at that time. Prior to that, there was a lot of uh, emphasis on how would you apply such and such procedure or rule to see if the student understood it. And then after that, there began a series of checkouts which were quite wicked and evil. The, one of them I remember that one of the supervisors thought was the most fiendish question that he asked anybody was, what were the typist's initials on the bottom of the bulletin? <laughs> the student didn't know and hadn't considered that important, and the supervisor jumped all over him and said, ah, you flunked, you didn't duplicate the material well enough, so you didn't know what the typist's initials were. And for a while, for about a month, it went through a period of um, of uh, sort of a games condition between the supervisors and the students, the two students trying to guess what silly question the supervisor was likely to ask him. <laughs> and then that fad fortunately died out. And somewhat later, there was a policy letter written about theory checkouts and how they're required to uh, consult the person's understanding and that uh, questions <clears throat> that don't do that tend to ARC break the students, which I think was a mild expression of what went on during that period at St. Hill. Anyway, uh, the duplication drills were born out of that, and uh, quite aside from their origin, they have quite a lot of, um, of benefit in themselves there's intrinsic value in duplication drills and being able to improve one's ability to duplicate. Some of those, um, or similar drills, if anyone's interested in looking them up, are in one of the PABs called um, the education drills. And they're quite interesting to do if uh, you have a few minutes sometime and nothing else to do. You could look them up and practice doing them and see if you get a result. They, they work rather rapidly. They're better done with somebody else, but some of them can, you can just do yourself as a duplication drill. It tends to sharpen up your 
ability to duplicate in your memory and so on. Then, um, during a period, during a long period at St. Hill, from about uh, March of 62 through until toward the end of October, nobody was allowed to graduate because the main research processes that LRH was developing were changing very rapidly. It started out with SOP goals or standard operating procedure goals as the mainline technique or procedure that was going to produce clears. And so the briefing course started out in early 62 as the course where people were going to learn how to find their PC's goal and run it and produce a clear. Uh, SOP goals quickly um, changed to uh, through various things. One was 3D, routine 3D, and then routine 3D crisscross, and then it changed to routine 3G, then routine 3GA, and then routine 3GA crisscross, and so on. And if you look up the tapes of that period, you'll see a large number of changing procedure names. And <clears throat> he was researching these procedures at night, and he'd write them up, and we'd come in in the morning, and the latest procedure would be pinned up on the student bulletin board, and we'd all quickly study it from that, and then we'd go audit it that day. And um, sometimes the procedure would last for one day, sometimes for as long as a week. And um, quite often it would change about every two days, though. It would be some refinement or whatever, so we were continually uh, keeping up to date with what he was doing on the research line. And nobody graduated during that period <clears throat> of about six or eight months because the idea was that um, we were gonna, everybody was going to wait on the course until the research was complete and the procedure had stabilized out so that these people going back to various parts of the world would be able to go back, able to find PC's goals. And um, at that time, the hope was that that would result in making clears. Then <clears throat> the various goals and um, listing procedures stabilized out around about October, October, November of 1962, and people started graduating again. And there was a big party held at St. Hill to celebrate the fact that graduations were occurring again. Uh, Ron and Mary Sue were there and uh, all the St. Hill staff and the students. And it was a big change in, in atmosphere because up until that time and just prior to that, it had started getting a little grindy with some people wondering when they were going to get home. And uh, the fact that graduation started again was cause for a, a very big celebration in what is now called the chapel at St. Hill. And um, LRH played his guitar and sang some songs and uh, I think put down as much rum as everybody else <laughs> and warm English beer. It was one of uh, the rare moments when he let his hair down, so to speak. So that's another side of his character that isn't uh, isn't always seen in the red volumes or the green volumes, but made him more of a personable person. Anyway, I graduated from the briefing course toward the end of 62 and went back to New Zealand. Um, around the same time in Scientology, the Australian Inquiry had gotten going over in Melbourne in Australia. And... There was a lot of uh, talk about this Australian inquiry, not as part of the briefing course, but LRH used to stroll around during lunchtime and during, um, well, he was there He was there in the course room a lot during course hours, but he was also frequently around during lunchtime and during breaks and would often chat with, uh, you know, any group of students that happened to be around. Mm -hmm. And he talked quite a lot about the Australian inquiry that was going on and what his views were about it and how it got going. And I thought I'd mention this because I think it's, I think it's significant. The thing that started off the government inquiry into Australia in the first place was a refusal on the part of the organization there to refund a dissatisfied PC his uh, processing fee. <clears throat> 
And, of course, the organizations had all been advertising for quite some time that any dissatisfied PC could instantly have his money refunded to him. And I think it's, it's not just a matter of this person being dissatisfied and asking for a refund, but it was the fact that that was heavily promoted, that, it, that people could immediately have a refund if they weren't satisfied. And then when the guy asked, he was told he couldn't have a refund. And then he went through various delays and so on of being told that he could and couldn't and so on. And which, of course, was routine, even in those days, that although the policy, the stated policy was that people could have their money back if they asked for it, in actual practice they never did, or it was dragged out as long as possible. And that person happened to have fairly high government connections and so on, and raised a stink about it being false advertising. And uh, that's what started off the Australian Inquiry. And it sort of stands out to me because there's been, you know, considerable repeat of that type of behavior later. It's a matter of not just on refunds, although that's also true that it's been promoted and then not done, but it's the idea of somebody or organizationally putting out one idea and then doing something different. And it invariably causes upsets. <clears throat> anyway, um, uh, just before I left St. Hill, I had a, or well, the last day I was there, the day I graduated, um, in those days we all got, on your graduation day, you got to get an interview with LRH in his office, and um, I went in there about three o'clock in the afternoon for my interview with LRH, and he started outlining his plans for what he wanted uh, done in the org in Auckland and New Zealand and what he wanted to go on in New Zealand. And he started planning things out and writing them down on pieces of paper and handing them to me. And the more he wrote, the more he thought. And uh, five o'clock came and went. And um, then time went by and we were still sitting there. And uh, I'd ask him, I kind of enjoyed it. And so every now and again, it sort of... Uh, finish and pass me the end of the last piece of paper in a series and I'd ask a question and I found out that every time I asked a question he'd go on talking <laughs> and um, around about eight o'clock in the evening I think it was Mary Sue came in and told him his dinner was cold and uh, so on and it finally uh, the interview was finally over I was appointed um, he gave me a handwritten appointment to uh, my post, the, the post I was going to have, which was HCO Exec Sec for New Zealand. Um, at the time, New Zealand had been part of Australia and had been run by Australia, and he decided to separate it out from Australia, partly because of the inquiry going on in Australia and partly because I think he was, um, he was expressing considerable displeasure with Peter Williams, who was the continental director for Australia and New Zealand at the time, and I think it was a way of telling Peter that, uh, Peter Williams, that he wasn't in favor also. Um, in fact, he wrote a note for me to, he wrote a note to Peter Williams that he asked me to take back to New Zealand and mail to him from New Zealand, telling him that uh, he wasn't in uh, the highest of favor, or to that effect. I think it was worded a little more strongly. Um, Anyway, after, when I left the briefing course, the, as I said, the pr technical procedures were changing very rapidly in those days. And actually, in the time it took me to fly back to New Zealand, um, when I left St. Hill, the day I left St. Hill, there was a particular procedure that was in use for running goals, a listing a mini, it was a mini, it was called a 114 line listing procedure. And by the time I got back to New Zealand, uh, there was a, not a telex in those days, but a cable had come in uh, revising the procedure and they were all doing something else by then. I didn't instantly fly back, fortunately. Um, and from then, um, Technically, there was suddenly there was R212 came out, which had a lot to do with uh, rock slams. When it first came out, by the way, um, R212 was a breakthrough, 
uh, there was a faster and more effective technique than the last technique. And in the initial issues that came out, especially the notes that came out prior to the bulletins, uh, anybody that had a rock slam was considered to be in a very advantageous position over somebody who didn't rock slam. And it was actually stated that it showed that their confront was higher and they were able to reach deeper into the bank and get closer to the rock chain. Um, within a matter of months, anybody who'd had uh, that advantage of, of the fame of uh, being a high confront case, case who rock slammed quickly had that taken away because um, within a few months later they were called rock slammers and they were the most wicked and bad people that could possibly be. There were later recurrences of that, of course, in later years where it became tantamount to, I guess, the worst accusation that could have been made of anybody if they were called a list oneer, meaning somebody that rock slammed on that famous list one. Anyway, that was 212, and um, after that, there were several other procedures that quickly changed from 212 back to um, goals and line plots, some of them called actual goals and GPMs, and other ones called implant goals and GPMs, and something called the helotrobus implants which uh, every org in the world received a cable from LRH about saying instantly and immediately uh, stop running whatever you're running now and start running the helotrobus line plots as soon as the line plots arrive in the mail. And um, it started off with the goal to forget, which was uh, implanted in a place called heaven. And um, I, I mentioned that the Australian inquiry was going on at the time. And it seems amusing now, but one of the ways that some of the local Scientologists decided to impress the, the uh, Queen's Councillor and so on who were conducting the inquiry was they decided to give him a demonstration of an auditing session in the courtroom. And they took the helotrobus line plot in and <laughs> explained to the whole court that it took place in heaven and there were 36 steps up to heaven and <laughs> started running this goal to forget and of course that hit hit the papers not only in Australia but also New Zealand and I think several other countries and we had uh, things were running pretty smoothly in New Zealand up until then <laughs> we had uh, had a lot of people coming in each week to uh, find out how to prove, improve their communication and getting along with other people. And then suddenly there were these articles about heaven and, and perhaps hell in the newspapers and we were having to handle people's questions about, uh, are you mixed up with that outfit in Australia? That <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, um, and then from uh, there, that the next procedure that came out was R3R, and that one lasted for a very long time. R3R came out in 63, and then it just went on, good old running of incidents. That went on for quite a long time. And um, virtually, apart from some minor modifications later on and from R3R to R3RA, it's stayed in ever since. 1963 was one of the more stable years. Um, I remember doing a graph, or not a graph, but we had stats. This is prior to the statistics being put in, by the way, in orgs, but I remember we had, we used to keep various basic stats in the org in those years. And um, I remember somebody working out the org's major stats, its income and the amount of auditing and training that went on, not just weekly, but somebody sat down and calculated them out monthly, on a monthly basis, and again on a quarterly basis. And we had weekly, monthly, and quarterly graphs that we used to keep posted on the wall in the staff, there was a staff room in the org, and 
and um, every month and every quarter the stats went up throughout that period from the end of 62 through 1963 and actually through 64 too. There were two years, 63 and 64, and all the stats went up each month and they went up each quarter. It was a very nice normal trend. And um, primarily the main technical procedures and advances that occurred during that time were um, data about service facsimiles called R3SC at that time. And um, it was a pretty stable period. We used to get uh, quite a lot of letters from LRH about the org and about the technical results. But there was nothing, uh, there was frequent com. But there was nothing major or um, particularly uh, that changed procedure, either organizationally or administratively or technically. And it was a very stable period, and there was a lot of expansion going on. In fact, a lot of the stuff that LRH was writing to us about was to do with expansion, to do with PE courses. Um, there was a competition that he held between all the orgs in the world to, as to who could come up with the best um, newspaper ad that got the most people, most new people in. And every org was busily putting newspaper ads in to get people in and keeping track of how many they got in and then trying a different one next week and then going back to the one that had got the most before and trying to improve that and they were comparing results. It was quite a, quite a fun game. So that was... Uh, that went on that way, actually, for two years, through 63 and through 64. And um, then something changed towards the end of 64. I don't know why or what it was based on, but not only were things very stable technically and organizationally, but fees were also stable. There was no, there'd been no change in prices for auditing or for courses during that period. And then, toward the end of 64, I think it was around October or November of 64, a price rise was announced. Every org in the world got this notice, and we were told to keep it confidential, but on the 1st of January 1965, the prices were going to go up. And they went up quite, quite markedly. I've forgotten exactly how much, but it was somewhere around about a quarter or a third more than what they'd been. And these days, um, talking about prices going up, I guess, is a little different from what it was like in those days. If you can imagine um, in that year of 1964 when the prices had been the same for years and years and years and nobody had even considered that the prices would go up, let alone have it announced, but it was just, you know, the price of auditing was blah, and, you know, HPA courses were blah, and they'd been that way for years, and as far as everyone knew, they were going to go on that way. And then it was announced in magazines and so on that uh, on the 1st of January, 65, the prices were going to make this jump up. And it was, it met with considerable... Uh, disapproval and uh, upset among Scientologists generally. And I recall writing a number of dispatches to various executives, not just myself, but quite a number of the staff and other executives there at the org wrote a lot of dispatches <laughs> trying to get across what it was like and what pe how people felt about it. But comes the 1st of January 65, the prices all went up and everybody was ordered to charge these new prices and so on. And the result of it was that people just stopped buying auditing and training. Nobody uh, signed up for anything anymore. And it wasn't just true of the org in Auckland. Um, we used to have some letter correspondence with people in other orgs and phone calls to other orgs and so on and it was very consistent all over the world and basically most Scientologists just said no that was too much and they weren't going to pay those prices they'd wait till they came down which they figured they would inevitably have to and then 
So there was a major, very major change occurred then. And in the early months of 65, um, the org's income and everything else just went out the bottom. And the org went empty, and or virtually empty, and uh, most of the staff were busy writing more and more letters and making more and more phone calls until uh, that was the solution we were supposed to use, was write more letters and make more phone calls. And that was also the beginning of people on the CF of the org starting to receive um, not just an, a, letter a, a letter a month or, say, every few weeks, but they started getting a letter a week and then uh, maybe two letters a week and many phone calls and so on. But... Interestingly enough, in those days, most of the Scientologists simply decided that they weren't going to pay the higher prices, and that was that. And uh, their decision stuck. And a few months later, the prices were dropped back to what they had been before, because it was obviously an unworkable change. Um, but also... There were some other changes that took place at the same time period, and I um, I was recalling them and remembered them. I, I suddenly remembered a few things that I'd forgotten about that occurred at that time. And I made a note, because I think it's interesting. Um, the prices went up on the 1st of January, 65, and then the first justice appeal came out on the 6th of March, 65, and then on the 17th of March, 65, the fair game law came out for the first time. And there were some other issues about ethics and justice. And then in April of 65, the prices were lowered. And on the 27th of April, 65, the policy letter called Price Engram. Anyway, on... On the 27th of April, 65, the PL price engram came out and prices stabilized. Then um, there were various policy letters that came out after that. We're now back on the, on the lowered prices, and the price is the same as they'd been during those stable years of 63 and 64. But there were PLs that came out. One of them was called the State of Emergency, and how things are stiffened up in a state of emergency. Um, staff member reports came out, and um, time machine orders, the policy on time machine orders. And they all came out during uh, the April-May period of 65. And then there was another series of things to do with, instead of raising the financial issues, but instead of raising prices this time, there were things introduced like... Um, Rebates, the rebates PL came out, which said that there couldn't be any rebates, and also packaging of ours, which was a different way. Instead of raising the prices, it made, uh, well, for example, one of the things that came out in mid-65 was that um, power processing, which had just been released, wasn't sold by the hour. It was a person had to buy 25 hours of power processing, and regardless of how long it took, like if it took 15 hours or 20 hours, they didn't get any of that money recredited or rebated back to them. It cost them the full 25. And then when release rehabs came out in 65, they were a minimum of five hours with the money not transferable or recreditable to another service, even though it would take less. But I thought it significant that there was so much uh, alternation between the the prices and, well, actually what started was the first thing that happened in that little sequence was there was a price rise which met with disfavor and um, conditions worsened and then ethics started getting heavy and then the prices dropped back and then there were different ways of raising the prices and a lot more ethics policies because we could sort of say, well, why didn't people do the same thing Years later, when the prices were being raised on a monthly basis, why, why if back in those days Scientologists have, you know, just sort of basically said no, why didn't that happen later? Well, in later years, I think it was mainly because of fear. Tremendous amount of fear of being declared an SP and fear of being cut off from the bridge and so on and so forth, which wasn't 
present. None of that had existed in those days prior to uh, 65. So while uh, 62 and 63 and 64 were very stable years organizationally and stat-wise, uh, 65, I think, was probably the year of the most change organizationally in Scientology. And if I were asked to uh, put a date on when did I first notice the ARC start going out the window and um, the big stick start coming in, it was in 65, um, and it had a lot to do with uh, an attempted price rise. So I think that explains a lot, it does to me anyway, about what occurred in later years. And um, the heavy push on statistics also started happening in 65, around about mid-65 and later in 65. Now, of course, those things got much heavier later when the Sea Org was formed, but the beginnings of it occurred back in 65. Anyway, um, I guess I should end off on that uh, dull note of how bad it was back then, <laughs> when you only think it's been bad in recent years. <laughs> but it wasn't all bad back then, because um, those sort of things were just beginning, and people tended to sort of say, well, you know, things change a lot, and probably those policies will be cancelled, and so on. And um, then the first SP declare came out on anybody, and then the second, and then the third one, and then people started saying, well, hmm, maybe that one's around for a while to stay, and then by December of 65, the second policy letter came out on the fair game law, and people started to get a little more worried, so... Um, Although those days were still somewhat different from more recent years, they it really did start to get very heavy in those days. But also in 65, uh, power processing was researched and developed and released, and also the clearing course, and the clearing course was made available. And so people sort of uh, stopped worrying about prices and about all the heavy ethics and SP declares and fair game law and all that. And a lot of excitement started up about going to St. Hill and getting power and doing the clearing course. So that tended to offset it. And by the time we were uh, toward the end of... I went back to St. Hill myself in 65. Um... I was there at the time when the clearing course was released and got started on it and went back home to solo audit the clearing course by correspondence, which was the order of the day in those days. Everybody did the clearing course by correspondence, except for the staff living at St. Hill. Um, and there was a lot of excitement, and um, I also did the the first OEC course came out in the end of 65. So when I went back to St. Hill in the end of 65, I did the OEC course as well as starting on the clearing course. And um, in addition to uh, you know getting on to the clearing course, which I think was a much bigger thing in those days than today because for many years... Um, I think the major topic in Scientology in those days was clear and clearing and when the first clear was going to be made. Every Congress was about it. Every Scientologist that had a conversation was talked about it and there was tremendous speculation about uh, uh, who, would st who would be clear and when would clear start being made and so on and so forth. And then when the clearing course started, that was a very major event. So when I went back to St. Hill in 65, there were two major things that occurred. One of them was that uh, I actually got started on the clearing course, and the other one was that I sat in the uh, grounds at St. Hill on a uh, brick wall with LRH, and we had a long chat for about five hours about the organ Auckland and um, Scientology internationally and um, what he was researching, where he'd been driving in his Jaguar, uh, <laughs> greenhouses, and all sorts of things like that, which uh, was probably the main reason why I went to St. Hill to do the clearing course anyway. But um, 
and then so clearing came out the clearing course started in 65 and then of course not very long after that uh john mcmaster was announced as the first clear which was uh the cause of major excitement all throughout the scientology world there were events held in every org in the world and um it was a very very big thing because for years everybody had been you know hanging on the edge of when's somebody going to go clear and john mcmaster was officially announced as the first clear and then shortly thereafter people started being announced as clear number 2 and 3 and 4 and so on and uh that takes us up into the um the early part of 66 so we'll leave it at that for today and we'll carry on from there next time Thank you.